Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, your plan and purposes being continually unfolding here at Harvest. And Lord, that as your word goes forth, I do humble myself and recognize that in and of myself, I have nothing good to say, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through me. Give to your people what they need here today in this divine moment. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Just an announcement on uh, at the end of the service, we will have communion. Everyone's welcome to take communion, receive it. You don't have to be just a member here. You're welcome, guests. And then uh, we do have uh, a, a, what we call uh, Church 101. It's an information meeting about uh, the church. It's informal. We'll be in the conference room with the staff. Uh, you can ask questions, and we talk a little bit about the church and getting to know Harvest and uh, becoming a member uh, of the church. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, I have a couple of things, but uh, uh, one of, let's see, my main verse here. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 3.21. And I want to talk to you, uh, I've been stirred, especially from Russ's message last week. How many here heard that message I think it was a very appropriate message for our church. If you have it, you can go on to church app or uh, podcast, and you can get that and, and download that and listen to it. Uh, uh, it really spoke uh, to me, and I know to many of you. But with that, I walked away with the next step. And, uh, and what was stirring in my spirit is an overcoming church. That's, the, that's what came to me. And, and then I just subtitled this, Overcoming What?, and it's based on that verse. But, uh, uh, but Pastor uh, Ross message last week, he touched on it. He talked on pressing into that new life. And he talked about waking up every morning, getting in that athletic position and uh, ready for what life throws at you and the hurdles. And, and uh, that we are to contend and really we are to overcome. Can we just say that? Say overcome. It's a good word. I like that word. You know, Ecclesiastes, he used the verse, and it was kind of a solemn. He said, if the clouds are full of rain and empty themselves in the earth, and if a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it lies. And he brought perspective to that. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Seems like it's a self-explanatory verse, no kidding. But he talked about dead trees, things in our past, in our life, that they happen. A lot of times we don't understand them, and, and uh, we can't change. How many of you know some of the things in the past you just cannot change? And but he encouraged us and was symbolic in life and, and uh, things that don't make sense and, and things you just can't fix. This is what my takeaway was. And whether it was a past marriage or divorce or maybe failed relationships, family member relationships strained, church member relationships trained, changed, excuse me. But he said, don't die there. Don't, don't die there. Keep moving forward. And that, I believe, is the word for today and with this message of about overcoming. And, and he talked about not, you know, not getting paralyzed or shipwrecked, that the, these dead trees, you know. Uh, and then he used the story about the Canaanite woman, which has a tremendous, there's a message there. And uh, she was actually, the Canaanites were the enemies to the Jews. And, and uh, she was a Greek. And, uh, and I thought about what's the contrast, I mean, for a Canaanite to show up to see and speak to a Jew I thought it'd be like Ben Shapiro to show up at the DNC, a hundred times worse. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't belong here. And, uh, but, but, you know, it talks about how, you know, Jesus talks about crumbs and from heaven and, and uh, you know, such a small thing, a crumb from heaven. Uh, but I believe God has more crumbs, if I could say, for harvest. Did you hear that? There are some babies that haven't even been born yet that God has crumbs for, and families. There are people, there are young people here that someday will be married and have kids and raise a family and be a part of the fabric of Harvest, the church, and impact society with their life and their witness. Can I get an amen? And so, so I think there's a lot more that the Lord has, these crumbs. And, and, and you know, they can, a crumb can change your reality forever. I think of this building and uh, the time to build. I shared this story before, and I'll continue to share it because it's, the, it's a powerful, miraculous story where it was actually a, a, a November, uh, I believe it was the 24th in 2019. And some of you remember that service. Like, why do you remember that service? Because it was very the most depressing services in my life. <laughs> and it was when all the trustees came forward and we made an announcement, we cannot build. 
many were in that meeting and remember that? Okay, there's a few here. And we just, we just like, we can't do this. Their interest rates were 6.5%, which that would be nice right now. Oh, we're getting close to that. And we just can't, you know, we just, and, and we were raising some money. We had this property. We were in the old building. And I left after that, and I was, I'll just be honest with you, I was depressed. It was sad. And I was just thinking, this is a hopeless thing. And I was like, God, you've given us the land. You, you're providing so much for us. And, and this isn't like after two years. This is 20 years in, <laughs> you know. So you talk about the patience of Job. Job's trial lasted nine months. I got him way beat. <laughs> okay? I <laughs> mean, 20 years. Anyhow, um, it was that spring of, two, you know, 2020, COVID, all the goofiness started happening. And all of a sudden, and this is the thing that really, I, I was really upset. I was upset with, because I felt that when God said, this is the time to build, or when he would say that, it would be a real demonstrative moment. How many know what I mean? Lights flashing, you know, his Shekinah glory would show up, and I would fall down like a dead man. And Lord, what is it? It's time to build, son. <laughs> None of that happened. None of that happened. I was so, I was actually, I was, I was frustrated. All it was this sense is like a crumb from heaven that fell in and said, it's time. That's all it was. That was it. And it was time and everything came together. And we started to build immediately during COVID, actually, where everyone was locked up, tied in a drum. Amen, somebody. And we were moving forward. We were overcoming as a church. I love that. Someone say amen. The overcoming church. So as the church, we're called not only to exist, but we're called to overcome. And many Christians, they've gotten into a place where they're just going to exist, hunker down. Things are bad out there. Have you noticed? They're getting worse. It's really, really bad. You know, just existing. You know, if you read the Old Testament and you want to find out how things were really bad, just, just go, start digging into some of the Old Testament books where you couldn't even walk downtown to go visit the stores. You'd be attacked, assaulted, raped, murdered. It was barbaric, many of the, uh, the societies back then, without the kingdom of God and, 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 and the word of God. It was horrible. And so in one sense, in many ways, that we're extremely blessed, all right? So you sometimes have to keep a perspective. Now, there are some cities you don't want to walk into. Okay, but we're still at this point in Alexandria, I thank God that you can drive around. I mean, you could do a road trip. How many have done a road trip recently? You've taken off and driven somewhere, whether it's business or, yeah, you know, we'll do it. Sometimes we'll drive to Oklahoma or Texas and, or we have gone out west to Idaho. And, and it's beautiful in the country. And, yeah, you have to be conscientious of what you're doing. But, but we're still free in America at this point. Amen? We want to keep it that way. And so, but it's true that our journey of faith is marked by challenges and trials and battles. But we still serve a God who empowers his people to be more than conquerors. We still do. And today, I just want to touch on that, what it means to be an overcoming church, a church that rises above adversity and stands strong in the face of opposition. Are you ready this morning? Revelation 3, Revelation 3, 21. Maybe you can help me pull that up. Thank you. Revelation 3.21, Jesus said to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus overcame, and we say, well, of course he did. He was the son of God, but he wants us to overcome too. Can you see that in there? Say amen. That's what it's saying. Now, the Greek word for overcome is a pretty cool word. It's actually the word Nikon. It's where we get Nike, the sneaker, the name, the name. They stole it from the Bible. Nike. And it means to conquer, to prevail, to carry off the victory. And it actually personalizes it. It actually means I conquer. You conquer. You prevail. You are victorious. And so the verb, though, implies that it's a battle. Somebody shout a battle. Yeah, we know that. It is a battle. It is a battle. And so I thought about it. I was like, okay, we're called to overcome. But what are we called to overcome? And I want to go through, I have some quick bullet points, and we're going to receive communion here. But I thought, how many of you know that we're supposed to overcome all evil, all works of darkness, bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, and, uh, you know, a crumb. <laughs> and I believe, once again, there are more crumbs that God has for he, us here at Harvest. So we know that Jesus 
won the ultimate victory over Satan. Can I get an amen? He won that. And, 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 and the, his demons, they were, they, were, they, were, they were defeated. But how many knows evil still exerts its force? And some people, it's hard for them to comprehend. It's like, why? I mean, if God is all-powerful, why can't he stop the evil? He can. But when he does that, he will judge all things. So at this time and for this season, evil, it may seem at times, is rampant. And you can think like, well, either Jesus is indifferent of our plight. He kind of came, he died, he rose from the dead, and he just washed his hands, and he's up in heaven kind of about other things and other galaxies, and he's forgotten about us. Or he's wanting us, his church, to take a stand. He's wanting us, thank you for that one yes, amen. He's wanting us, his church, to rise up. He's wanting us to be in, take on his power and to move on his behalf. Can you say amen? He's wanting us to rule and reign. He's wanting us to enforce, watch this, the victory that was already won. So why would we need to do that if it was already, if Satan is already defeated, I mean, why? Because how many know Satan is a thief? He's a liar, all right? And that's how he works. He works over our minds and our hearts, and he, he deceives us. He's a deceiver, and he's a crook, and he's a liar. How many know there are laws against crime, but every single day in this community, I hear the sirens of some police officer. I hear some fire truck. I hear, there's stuff happening, right? In any community. Some communities, it's more. But they're, 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 why? Because we need people to enforce the laws that are on the book. Now, right? So too in the church. This whole God is sovereign. Yes, he's sovereign in his kingdom. And this mindset that's up here in Minnesota, especially, it's just God's going to do whatever he wants to do. And, and so we're just a little pawn sitting here. And God moves in mysterious ways. Yes, but he does speak to his people. Come on now. All right? And so the fire needs to get up underneath us thinking that, well, we're waiting on God. God's waiting on us. Faith is action. It's decision. We need to move. You say, well, is that just, you know, you don't need God? No, we're only moving because we live and move within him. He gives us the power. And so, you know, let me just say, it's about enforcing the victory and about Satan is a liar, is a liar. John 8, 44. Another verse here. I don't know what's going on here. Maybe you can help me with this. John 8, 44. Another verse. The Bible says this, that you are your father, the devil, and it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Jesus is speaking to religious leaders. He said, there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks of what is natural for him, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies and half truths. Now watch this. This political situation today is that that verse right there is speaking to it. There, father of lies and half-truths. You're seeing that blasted constantly. You know, I like, uh, it was, uh, I think it was um, Tucker Carlson. He had uh, he told about a story, an analogy about our society today. And he said, his, a dad tells his son, son, stay away from the cookie jar. You can't have any until after dinner. And then he goes and, and he finds his son and the cookies are gone and there's all crumbs in his hands and, and his mouth is full of crumbs. And the dad said, I told you to not eat any cookies till after dinner. Why did you eat those cookies? And his son looks at him and says, I didn't eat the cookies, you did. And his dad's looking, what are you talking about? He goes, I didn't eat those cookies, you ate those cookies. That's the society today. This is what we live in. Lies that are so bold-faced, saying things. And you know what? Here's the sad thing is people are gullible. And they believe them. And I look and say, I won't use pronouns, but they are lying. <laughs> I've had sock and throw it at the TV. You know what I mean? It's like, they're, and so, so who is behind the lies? Satan. He's the father, and it's actually talking on a murderer, Cain. Cain was a murderer, murdered his brother. And so we, we just see that from the beginning. Anyhow, let me get back on track. What is the church? What should we overcome? What should we overcome? Uh, number one, you're going to have to help me with this because for something this isn't reading. But overcome what? First point. Let's go to the first point there. We're to overcome sin and temptation. Sin and temptation. Uh, the church is called to overcome sin through the power of Christ. What does that involve? Not only individual victory, 
um, personal victory over sin, but it is also helping others. When the church is to help others within the church community to live holy lives. How many of you know that when you're around other people, the desire to do good, how many of you know that helps you to do good, right? If you leave here and you go with your buddies or your friends or your girlfriends and all they're doing is drinking, partying, sleeping around, come on, somebody, that's gonna wear on you. But when you go out with some godly ladies and our, our men, you know what? That, that, that's not what they're gonna do or shouldn't do, amen? They're gonna stand for truth. They're gonna help you and encourage you. And so, so the church in that is we're, we're to overcome sin through the power of the Holy Spirit to live holy lives. And then when you stumble and you fall, how many know we get back up? We just get back up. There's no judgment and condemnation. We just get back up, all right? The second thing, persecution and opposition. Persecution and opposition. You know, the early church faced significant persecution. And I, I believe in some sense and, you know, I'm, I'm praying that it doesn't get worse. But boy, I'm concerned about our country. You know, they're coming after the church in believers. Persecution. Because why? It is the last uh, uh, solid frontier of truth in righteousness in our nation. You know, when you grew up back in the 40s and 50s, they had their struggles. But, you know, a lot of the people, they just, you know, you could walk down the street and, 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 you know, you could go to a local store and your kids. Listen, when I was a kid, my mom would call and scream from the house. All of us eight kids, we were called down back. Down back was probably a half a mile or three quarters of a mile away. She would just be screaming, it's time for dinner. Where were we? We were out playing. We were in the neighborhood. We were roaming around. I wouldn't let my kid do that. <laughs> you know, today, I'm like, what? And it just, it's, it's, society, it's changed. It's changed. But, but we are called to, uh, we're going to face significant persecution. And, and the overcoming church is one that stands firm in its faith, even when facing opposition from the world. Can I get an Amen whether in the form of social pressure, legal challenges at times, and outright hostility. We are to still stand strong. Can I get an amen? Another thing, division and disunity. The church must overcome internal divisions, whether they are based on, at times, doctrine, ethnicity. Sometimes it's personal grievances. Unity in the body of Christ is a powerful testimony to the world, and it's vital for the church's strength and effectiveness. You know, the Bible says in Romans 12, 18, it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so the challenge is, is in our part that we are, on our, do all we can, but sometimes, it's, sadly, it's not possible in some situations, but we are to try. We are to try. Can I get an amen on that? The next is um, worldliness. Worldliness. Are you able to pull all that up? Thank you. <clears throat> worldliness. Thank you. The church must overcome the pull of worldliness, the tendency to conform to patterns and values and priorities of the secular world rather than the kingdom of God. And what does that mean? Well, let's just down, get down to the nitty-gritty. That means that we need to resist materialism. You know what that means, right? Stuff. Selfishness, the pursuit of power, prestige, worldliness. We have to be kept in check on that. Amen? False teachings, number five, and heresies. The church must guard against false teachings that can lead believers astray. It's amazing. They arise, and people follow these teachings, and they're actually unbiblical, or they're half-truths, and people get delusional, and they get caught up in it. Because they think, well, this person seems like they're a normal person and you know, we should follow them. And, and blindly, people just follow. Because people follow people, but really people should follow the Lord. Amen? Follow the Lord. Follow the Lord. So, these, so an overcoming church, it's vigilant in maintaining sound doctrine. And, you know, and there's a lot of, there's podcasts out there and there are a lot of defenders of truth. And some of them I would say stay away with, but there are some of them that are really solid and, and, and they're helping bring clarity to a lot of goofiness that's out there. And, uh, and so I'll just, you know, there, there, there is that. There, there is uh, truth. Uh, I call them uh, white corpuscles, you know, in the blood. How many of you know they, 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 in, they attack infection? <clears throat> but if you have, you know, too many of them, well, then that's a disease. So you do need a balance, amen? Need a balance. So 
uh, discerning truth from error, equipping its members to do the same. Number six, apathy and lukewarmness. Apathy and lukewarmness. Spiritual complacency and lukewarmness can weaken the church's witness and effectiveness. And so the overcoming church is a church that's passionate about its mission and missions. Can I get an amen? And but also fervent in prayer, active in service, always seeking to grow in love and being faithful to Christ. Number seven, fear and doubt. You know, there are still people that they are still traumatized by COVID. And I just, I don't know, just, it blows me away. Maybe, maybe, you know, the situation is they're more susceptible to certain things and that may be, but some people just think, no, this is beyond this. This is fear. People just living in fear and in doubt. And so the church, we need to overcome fear and doubt. Why? Because fear and doubt can paralyze believers and prevent them from stepping out in faith. Isn't that right? And so we need to trust in God's promise and his presence and overcome, be the overcoming church, advancing the mission, the gospel, even though there are uncertainties and challenges. Number eight, spiritual warfare. We talked on this a lot in the past, but the forces of darkness that seek to hinder God's work. How do we do that? You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then we get the challenge in Ephesians 6. What does that mean? We do that through prayer. Somebody shout prayer. Prayer is not a curse word. Prayer is a good word. Amen? Through the word of God, speaking the word, getting the word going forth, the authority given in Christ. And so an overcoming church stands firm against the devil's schemes. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Every Saturday morning from 9 to 10, we pray here as a church. Now, we have a core group of intercessors, and uh, Mira Lee is, is head of intercessor here, but there are the ladies that come. I want to encourage you to come out Saturday, 9 a.m. to 10, and we pray, and, and uh, we've done that. And then on Sunday mornings, they meet actually in the back room there uh, at uh, 9 to 9.30. Uh, there's, there's prayer there. That is open to all to pray. Can I get an Amen. I would say number nine would be cultural irrelevance. And, um, and this is when I started, we started Harvest. I was real concerned about, you know, in many ways, the, there's a temptation for the church to retreat into irrelevance or, or the other side of the pendulum is we become indistinguishable from the culture. We're so much like the world. And you see a lot of that in some churches today. You can't distinguish it. It's like, it just seems like it's a riot concert party there. I mean, who, you know, and so that's not what we're called to, but we need to be culturally relevant and be salt and light. Amen. Salt and light, addressing spiritual and moral needs of society, but also faithfully proclaiming the gospel. Can I get an amen? I'm almost done. I would say number 10 in, um, um, and, I, and I thought about this one. I thought, you know what? It's true. And I have some verses I want to share about it because I am also passionate about this, but uh, sometimes we don't talk about this a lot, especially in Christian circles, about injustice and social evil. You know, the Bible says in Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Amos chapter 5, verse 24 says, but let justice run down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream flowing abundantly. Isaiah 117, learn to do good. Hmm. Seek justice. Rebuke the ruthless. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the rights of the widow in court. So the overcoming church is called to be a voice for justice. Can I get an amen? Now, we have a skewed version of that, and there's a lot of delusional half-truths with that. But for the church, we need to stand against social evils, and now, how many know God hates poverty? Poverty, he, the Lord said, the poor will always be with you, but he hates it. Racism, there's, there's the spirit of racism that exists and inequality. But an overcoming church engages in works of mercy, advocacy, reflecting God's heart for the oppressed and marginalized. Amen? Stand with me if you would, please. Uh, pull up that last line, communion. Uh, we're going to receive communion now as you come forward and worship team. But uh, I'm going to pray. You know, but as an overcoming church, 
We are not defined by the absence of trials, but how we respond to them. We are empowered by God to overcome, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God, through faith in the one who has already overcome the world. You know, there's a verse in Revelation 12, 11, it reminds us, the Bible says this, that they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And then it says this, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Wow. Wow. So as a church, I want us to be reminded today that God has called us to be overcomers. Amen, church? To overcome. And we overcome, as that verse says, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, by standing firm in our faith, no matter what we face day in and day out. Every head bowed, please, this morning here this morning as a pastor I'm not I'm not right with the Lord I want to invite you to pray a prayer a simple prayer here a very powerful prayer for you can get right with the Lord some of you came in carrying some things and you sense the presence of God here today but you're not wholeheartedly following the Lord you haven't taken the first step to surrender your life to Christ the Bible says you must be born again what is that that means you have the power to surrender your life, your spirit, soul, and body, your, your spirit, man, or woman to God. You can make him, you can invite him in your life. If that's you today, said, I've never really done that. Repent of your sins, invite him in. He will take up occupancy in your heart. And the Bible says you will be born again. If you haven't done that, and you're stirred in this moment, with every head bowed, I'd like to lead us in a prayer, a prayer of salvation, a prayer of consecrating your life, surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you, pray with me. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, come into my life. Save me. I thank you for saving me. Jesus, I give you my life today. Now take it. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. Thank you for saving me. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.